desire life, it's in God. If I desire healing, it's in God. If I desire strength, it's in God. If I desire holiness, somebody shout, it's in God. If I need prosperity, it's in God. If I need joy, it's in God. If I need peace, somebody say, it's in God. Everything I need in order for me to be complete, everything I lack that makes my life whole, everything I desire to give me validation, I can find it in Jesus. Touch your neighbor, say, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead. So if I desire to be made full, I've got to pitch my tent in his tent. I've got to build my home in him. I got to live and move and have my being in him. Colossians 2 and 9 says, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Then he says, in the very next verse, after it says that in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, he turns around and says, and you are complete in him. Touch your neighbor and tell him, I don't need a job to complete me. I don't need money to complete me. I don't need a man to complete me. I don't need a woman to complete me. I don't need anybody, anything to complete me. In him dwells all the fullness that I need and I am complete as long as I am in him. Cop your hands and give him glory. So when he says the word became flesh, it refers to the incarnation, which is the act or fact of God becoming man. The fact that God, the eternal word, in all of his glory as creator of all things, which is beyond human comprehension. Because we all know how to create out of pre-existent matter. <laughs> but we don't know how to create out of nothing. That's beyond human comprehension. And the fact that he will become flesh portrays a type of love which cannot even be imagined, fathomed, comprehended, or understood by man. And, what, and, and what's of real significance is the fact that he will retain his body, his flesh, forever, albeit in a glorified form. He won't have blood as we know it, but he will retain that. This act of the word becoming flesh made Jesus God's son. Because sonship, sonship in connection with the Lord Jesus always refers to humanity and never to deity. He was always the word, but he was not always flesh. But he never ceased being the word when he became flesh. Help me, Holy Ghost. When Jesus became flesh, his moral glory brought back to the human family the image of God. We had no standard of absolutes until Jesus became flesh. Man had departed from God and lost his image. So the true image, the real image of God came to dwell with man in order for the Holy Spirit to dwell in man so that man could then dwell in God. Let's all stand to our feet. Lastly, when he said we beheld his glory, it speaks of his deity. In, 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 in his incarnation, Jesus, while retaining his possession of deity, he laid aside his expression of deity. His glory was not only represented in who he was, it was also represented by what he did. So that every time he performed a miracle, he was simply transferring a portion of his glory to man. Every time he healed a body, every time he moved supernaturally, he was allowing man to behold his glory. So that even as Moses asked to see God's glory, watch this, every time you see Jesus moving among mankind, what you're actually seeing is the glory of God. All of you are simply manifestations of the glory of God. The fact that he intervened in your life, mm, changed you on the inside and, put, uh, and started you in a different direction, that's simply a manifestation of the glory of God. Let's clap our hands and give him praise tonight. I went longer than I intended to. Lift your hands and let me bless you. Father, in the tremendous name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve, we thank you once again for the light that accompanies the entrance of your word. I pray, O oh Lord, that 
Amen. The illumination, the revelation, and the inspiration that we received will germinate within our spirits and cause a manifestation in our lives.